From the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council, this is the Princeton Spark. I'm Wright Sinieris. The various people that make up the Princeton entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystem have long been at work, taking risks to bring transformational ideas and companies to the world in the nation's service and the service of humanity. Hello and welcome to the Princeton Spark, a production of the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council. I'm your host, Wright Sinieris, social media and marketing specialist at the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council. At PEC, we support Princeton Connected Startups and help to build the regional entrepreneurial ecosystem in New Jersey and beyond. In this first season of the Princeton Spark, we'll explore what it takes to succeed in entrepreneurship from experienced Princeton startup founders, investors, mentors, and more. We'll look at their experiences in different industries, but we will likely see that these experiences are not so different. Through these shared experiences, we will illuminate some aspects of the startup journey for the benefit of early career and first-time founders. In our series opening three episodes, we're exploring three important aspects of entrepreneurship. If you hadn't heard the first episode on taking risks, it's available now at princetonspark.com or wherever you get your podcasts. So do check that out. In our series opening three episodes, we are exploring three important aspects of entrepreneurship. If you haven't heard the first episode on taking risks or the second episode on thriving under uncertainty, they are available now at princetonspark.com or wherever you get your podcasts. So please check them out. It's a widely held notion that most startups fail. Depending on whom you ask, it's somewhere between 50 and 90%. That's a lot. But it's also a common phrase that investors like to back the jockey, not the horse. That is to say, the person and team executing the idea can be more important than the idea itself. In this episode of the Princeton Spark, we will talk to entrepreneurs who quote unquote failed in their first startups. They got back on the entrepreneurial horse and now are on to their next startups and endeavors. We'll explore how they persisted through failure on their way to success. Our first one today is Stuart Allum. Uh, my name is Stuart Allum. I'm Princeton class of 2013. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and I run a company called Thousand Fell. Stuart is a co-founder of Thousand Fell, a completely circular and sustainable sneaker company. His first startup, a sneaker company called House of Future, received an investment from the Princeton Alumni Entrepreneurs Fund in 2017. Normally, after funding from Princeton in the form of AEF, a company would be on their way. Fast forward a year, and Stuart wound up leaving House of Future. During our interview, he wasn't able to get into the specifics of why he left, but more importantly, he could talk about what he learned from the process. I think, I think when you're in it and when things aren't going well, it feels uh, like an epic failure. Um, and it's hard to separate yourself. You're, you're so close to, to these projects. You're pouring all of your time and energy into it. And it's hard to take a step back. Um, I think what I've learned uh, is when I've kind of cleared those hurdles and, and finished with projects or finished with companies, um, and had an opportunity to sort of really decompress and figure out what I've learned. Um, it's just fantastic learning opportunities. Um, and you're able to kind of pick up a really important set of skills along the way and really build out um, or rather or rather fill sort of gaps in your in your professional you know skill set. Um, and a lot of those failures help you realize what you didn't know and help you realize what you need next time around, what you immediate, immediately need to get off the ground. That next time around, he was ready. When I went to start this current company that I'm running, the first thing I did was I went out and I pinged the best of the best that I knew. Um, I built a board of advisors um, very early on uh, that knew a lot more about certain parts of either retail or footwear making or um, fundraising than I did. Um, and so I surrounded myself with the smartest people that I knew and that were the most capable um, to kind of help us build this company. Uh, and so I sort of was able to hedge my bets and in, in where I wasn't quite as strong. Um, I think I think in the like the startup world, failure is kind of like a badge of honor in many ways. Um, and so many great there's there are some fantastic and super successful first time founders. Um, and there are some there are some men and women that just hit it out of the park kind of first time around. But a lot of really big, successful companies and great founders um, ha have had previous failures. Um, and I think it's how you learn from them. Uh, I, I, I can't stress this enough, and I feel like I'm parroting on what a lot of people say in the industry, but um, st startups are, are about constantly putting out fires and things that aren't going well. Um, it's an incredible emotional roller coaster of highs and lows. Um, and I think um, 
oftentimes more lows than highs when you first start out. Uh, and, and it's people telling you no all the time, uh, especially when it comes to fundraising. Uh, and I, it's, ex it's exhausting. Um, but, but if you can get through that and you can change your mindset where it's another like data point, it's another bit of feedback that allows you to then sort of better inform what you're doing, go forward. It's incredibly valuable. Um, and it can't be taken personally. How did he actually persist through it? It took me, I took about four weeks off uh, or maybe six weeks off and was really trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I think uh, I mentioned I was initially just going to jump right into studying for the GMAT and going to business school. The idea being um, I had given it, given it a good try with startups um, and maybe jumping into business school would allow me to pivot to something bigger or um, provide me sort of, again, those gaps in a, in a professional skill set that I needed. Um, but, but had this idea that drew on a lot of the experience that I had from, from the previous company, but was again like completely different and very new mm -hmm. um, and was really excited by the idea. Not letting go of an idea, another spark that can ignite an entrepreneurial journey. Kind of through that process, um, stepping away from the company it took me about three months to kind of wind things down financially and hand over responsibility and, and kind of officially left um, at the end of May. Um, and May they, of 2018? Yes, May of 2018. Okay. Um, and during that time, I was working pretty closely with my current co-founder, also my girlfriend, Chloe, um, who's a co-founder here on uh, Thousand Fell with me. Um, and a lot of conversations we were having were around sustainability. Um, and if she was here, I could, she could jump in and give you her background a little bit better than I could. But uh, a lot of those conversations stemmed from um, what Gap was doing with Arrow, um, their innovation lab. Um, and we realized that we're really on the precipice of uh, biofabrication, cellular agriculture, um, chemical recycling. There's just so much that's happening um, kind of at the forefront there. And we realized we think that there's enough material innovation out there now to really apply this to the product that we know best, which is footwear. Um, uh, we should we should give this a, a shot. We should try to really make this something that's circular and something that's sustainable. Stuart and Chloe built the best network of product designers, branding agencies, sales production teams they could find. Brought them together and now Thousand Fell is launching in October of 2019. You can read about the completely circular and sustainable life cycle of the Thousand Fell sneaker at thousandfell.com. After the break, we return to our conversation with Vitey Murdy. Vitey co-founded Frenzy, which occupied some dizzying heights in the matchmaking space. You can hear him in episode one, so if you haven't had a chance to listen, we'll wait here while you do that. When we come back after this short break, We'll learn how he felt when it was time to say goodbye to Frenzy. The Princeton Entrepreneurship Council, Princeton Department of Athletics, Princeton Association of New York City, and Princeton Alumni Angels cordially invite you to join fellow Princeton alumni, students, and their guests at the third Tiger Entrepreneurs Conference on Friday, November 8th in New York City. A one-day conference featuring dynamic keynote speakers, panel discussions, workshops, and a startup showcase. Our venue is the fabulous Altman Building, located in the Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan. Tickets and more information are available at entrepreneurs.princeton.edu. Welcome back to the Princeton Spark. Failure is a rich topic for discussion in the startup world. Right this second, somewhere in the world, a startup has failed. Uh, probably. Here is what Vitey Murdy thinks of what the end of Frenzy was like. And the term itself could be a loaded term. Do you characterize the end of Frenzy as a failure? What a great question. <laughs> what a great loaded question. <laughs> yeah. Um, Take okay. that as you will. Okay, so if you had asked me in the first like year or year and a half um, if I characterize it as failure, I would have said yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably because society conventionally defines like what happened to us as failure, right? The mm -hmm. media writes about all of these companies who, or companies specifically founders who've managed to like, you know, build like this huge viral success overnight or like hit it out of the park and like sell their company at like a 10X, 100X multiple mm -hmm. um, of what, you know, they were invested in at. And when you like look at it in that like 
in that frame of mind than I, I, as that's how I was looking at it when it happened, I definitely felt, you know, really, really bad about it. And Mm -hmm. I felt, you know, super upset that like, I wasn't able to like return, you know, money on investment. Like we weren't able, like we weren't able to return money on like our investment. Mm -hmm. So like in, like in a financial sense, like, yeah, it was a financial failure. Um, And I think, you know, I worked, I talked to a lot of people like over that time period who like tried to like get me to change my perspective. Um, Really, I think what what changed it was when I was writing about uh, towards the end of December, I think in December of 2017, I was writing detailed investor updates for like every person who's ever put money into the company. And that is like, we had a bunch of angel investors in the beginning um, we had institutional investors like Slow Ventures, Letter Hippo Ventures, mm-hmm. um, and even Princeton, right? It was like, a, I guess, an institutional investor like in that round. Mm-hmm. And I wrote them like a, I would say like a, it was a five to 10 page like essay, <laughs> really just like try. It was a, a detailed like analysis on like what I think went wrong, um, just looking back and like areas where you know, that were in our control that maybe we could have done a little bit better and like areas that were out of our control that like really hurt our ability to grow into like what we wanted to grow Mm -hmm. into. And I was so like anxious, like as I was sending these out, I actually remember like I was like along with that, I sent out an email to all of our users then basically saying we were shutting down. Like I finally sent that out at around the Mm -hmm. same time. So Vitey writes this long missive sends it out by email to its investors, and then doesn't check his email for two weeks. And so as all of these emails were going out, this was like during the holidays of 2017. And I was just like, I was sobbing, like as it was happening. Like I remember like I was just crying my eyes out. And like my mom was sitting there like trying to comfort me. Like my sister was there like not understanding really what was happening, but also <laughs> trying to comfort me because I don't think she knew what emails I was sending out. She just saw me sitting there like a big sad lump. Um, And I actually didn't check my email for the next two weeks. Because I was just like, I like don't even want to see like what these investors write back to me. Like that's how scared and sad I was that they would be like, oh, like you took our money and like, you know, didn't deliver us a return. Like, Mm -hmm. and two weeks later, (laughs) sorry. Yeah, you're dead to us. Yeah, that's what I thought. Like you're dead to us, right? I felt dead to them. When he does finally open his email after two weeks. And I started to read through the responses and literally across the board, like every single person wrote back like a super nice response, basically commending us on like everything we did and telling us that, you know, they think that we gave this like the best shot that was possible. And they're like super impressed by how hard we worked, like how, how like, you know, how much we were able to stretch our runway and like keep this going, mm-hmm. like despite like all of these other roadblocks that that came up that we had to face and that this was the big thing, like multiple investors basically said that they were s- so proud of their investment and the impact that it made on the world. And that when like I start another company to let them know because they want to invest. DJ, play that back. When like I start another company, to let them know because they want to invest. They want to invest. They want to invest. Vitey got back on the entrepreneurial horse, and his investors are along for his newest ride, WIT, a video contest platform. You can download the WIT app from the Apple App Store and play along. After the break, we'll return to our conversation with Pilar castro Kiltz from Episode 2. When we left off with Pilar, we established that arts and entrepreneurship are so closely related in many ways, they're the same thing. And I think um, more... More often than we understand, we're saying the same things. Mm -hmm. We're just saying it differently. Nominations for the 2019 Tiger Entrepreneur Award are being accepted now, a prestigious award designed to celebrate the value of entrepreneurship and innovation across the Princeton community and to emphasize the university's commitment to entrepreneurship the Princeton way. This annual award is given up to four individuals or teams of undergraduate students graduate students, or early career alumni who demonstrate success in entrepreneurship. Visit entrepreneurs.princeton.edu slash award to make a nomination today.
Welcome back to the Princeton Spark. We talked to Pilar Castro Kiltz, an artist, dancer, choreographer, playwright, producer, artistic director. Suffice it to say, she's an entrepreneur. Artist and entrepreneur, one and the same. Moving between the arts and culture world and the startup world, there's a bit of code switching involved. But the word failure, it's the same in the arts as it is in the startup world. First, deeming something a failure. I think this is something I certainly struggle with. What is a failure and what is a success? Mm -hmm. And things that at the time felt like a failure, when I look back on them, they were just a, another, you know, kind of rep in my exercise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, you know, sit-ups hurt. Yes. Are they a failure? No. Right. Um, yeah, I think that as I look back, the way in which today I feel like I have failed often is when I had an expectation of how something would turn out and it didn't. Mm -hmm. And at the time it felt like, oh, I didn't achieve that thing. I didn't, you know, I didn't get that grant. I didn't mm -hmm. get that residency. Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, I'm not getting the awards that my friends are getting or my peers or my colleagues. No one's interviewing me at Forbes, you know, <laughs> whatever that, you know, whatever right. are those benchmarks. Mm -hmm. And um, when I, when I look back on that and what I, what I try to work on is that failure is something that we define when we fall short of either our expectations or the expectations of others. Mm -hmm. If I want to get philosophical about it, and I don't always please do, I don't always succeed at doing this. <laughs> yeah. Wow, this is very meta. Now. Yeah, and it's very meta. It's always meta. I don't always succeed at doing this, but rather than judging something as a failure, but judging something as feedback. Mm -hmm. This is, if I didn't get that award, if I didn't land that client, if I didn't get the residency or the grant or the the, the accolade, yeah, failure is feedback. I, I really think actually, you know, if it's not a failure, it's feedback. It's information of how you can improve, how you can pivot, how you can change, or how you just need to keep on keeping on mm -hmm. and ignore it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes... You know, I think a failure is when we, we do not meet expectations. And sometimes we shouldn't have had that expectation in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's when we, when we label something a failure that it actually results in true failure mm -hmm. because we let it get us down. Mm -hmm. And we let us, it define us. And when you're in the mindset of, I have failed, I think especially sometimes for the Princeton alumni community who are so accustomed to not failing, uh, it's when you use language like I have failed that it sometimes brings about greater failure because you get negative and you get down on yourself. Right. And if instead you view it as here's some more data, here's mm -hmm. some more information. Right. What do I do with mm -hmm. what just happened? Mm -hmm. And how do I adjust? How do I be agile and nimble and adaptive? Mm -hmm. I think adaptive is like my new favorite word. <laughs> mm -hmm. Adapt. Add to your professional skill set. Like Stuart said. And... What's next for Pilar? I would say synthesis uh, is is the big thing right now of bringing together mm -hmm. uh, my experiences as an artist, my experiences as an entrepreneur, and now the added information from business school to you know kind of put it all in the crucible and let it come together. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, going back to producing my art mm -hmm. and being more active as an artist. Mm -hmm. That's building more canvas because uh, part of more canvas is providing. Uh, Part of More Canvas is providing income opportunities for artists, mm -hmm. a, a way for them to have flexible work that teaches them industry skills in mm -hmm. case they ever have to pivot down the road. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see that expand. Mm -hmm. Synthesize. Persist. Succeed. In our show notes for this episode at PrincetonSpark.com, you can find links to More Canvas Consulting and Princeton Arts alumni. Many thanks to Stuart Allum, Vitey Murdy, and Pilar castro Kilts. The Princeton Spark is a production of the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council, engineered by Dan Kearns and Dan Kiyu at the Princeton Broadcast Center and produced by me, Wright Sinyaris. Music for this episode is by me, Wright Sinyaris, and our theme music is by The Treadmills. Special thanks to Rose Kelly, David Hopkins, Elio Leo, Tiger Gao, Margaret Koval, Beth Jarvie, Kristen Harold's daughter, Daniela DiLorenzo, Megan Donaghy, Josh Carter, Morgan Spencer, and the whole Princeton Entrepreneurship Council team, which is Anne-Marie Maman, Don Seitz, 
Lauren Bender, Diane DiLorenzo, Neil Betwin, and me, Wright Sinieras. The comments and suggestions box is always open. Send an email to sparkpod at princeton.edu. If there is a topic or a person that you think we should talk to, please let us know. If you still can't get enough of the Princeton Spark, we're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, too, at sign Princeton Spark. The views expressed by our guests on the show are theirs and do not necessarily reflect the views of Princeton Entrepreneurship Council or Princeton University. If you rate and review us on the iTunes store, it really does help people find the show. If you haven't subscribed to the show yet, please do so at princetonspark.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back in two weeks. Thanks for listening. The Thrive Conference, celebrating and empowering Princeton's Black alumni, returns to the Princeton campus from October 3rd through the 5th. The Thrive Conference presents entrepreneurial content on the afternoon of the 3rd, featuring keynote speakers, panel discussions, workshops, and a startup showcase. Registration information is available at thrive.princeton.edu.